Welcome to Danielle Smith's Razor Forum. This program is part of a series of podcasts doing in-depth interviews on free enterprise and personal liberty. I'm your host, Danielle Smith, president of the Alberta Enterprise Group. Go to fraserforum.org where you can subscribe, comment on the program, and see links to the studies we discuss. You will also find archives of previous episodes. Our email address is danielle at fraserforum.org. We'd love to hear from you. Just anecdotally, The only friends of mine whose kids didn't seem very affected by COVID school (laughs) policies and COVID in general were the homeschooling friends because um, because pretty much went on business as usual. Hello, I'm Danielle Smith. Welcome to another edition of Danielle Smith's Fraser Forum. I am very delighted today to be speaking about one of my favorite topics, which is education and speaking about it with Paige McPherson, who is the Associate Director of Education Policy for the Fraser Institute. Paige, thanks so much for being with me today. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Let's begin, I think we should probably set this into context because all of us think that, I think especially since it's been a long time since some of us were in K-12 education, I think we have memories of what education was like and we think it's kind of fixed at a point in time and it's operating exactly the same way today. But there are a huge number of different choices in how parents educate their kids, type of of schooling that's available to them, differences between the provinces. So I think we need to establish a bit of the base line about where we've been and and where we are so so first off uh, t- tell us um tell us what type of schooling right now most parents have their kids enrolled in well very clearly the numbers show that most parents in uh, in Canada in every province send their kids to public schools. So those are government operated schools. Uh, Depending on the province, you might be restricted to your local public school restricted by catchment area. Um, That tends to be the case more so in eastern Canada, where I live. So in Atlantic Canada and in Ontario, Um, in western Canada, you might have a little more flexibility, a little more choice as to which public school to send your child to. Um, You might not be restricted by a local catchment area, but still the vast majority of parents in Canada do send their children to public schools. Um, The the exception, well, not an exception, that's true in BC as well, but I do want to point out that in BC there is a particularly high level of students who actually attend uh, independent schools. Um, A little more than one in 10 students in the province actually attends an independent school, um, and that is the largest uh, share of students that do that in uh, in the country, but still the majority send their kids to public school. We'll probably end up spending some time talking about Alberta since it seems to have the most educational options. But, you know, I remember when I was a um, when I was talking to my parents about some of the family history, I had my great grandmother came from Atlantic Canada and she used to teach in a one room schoolhouse. And so you, you have to think about the transformation that has happened in education from those early days when we had mostly agricultural societies to where we are now, it seems almost impossible to imagine that you'd be able to operate a one-room schoolhouse. And yet that seems to be perhaps a new trend that that, uh, everything old is new again. One-room schoolhouses sound like they're making a comeback. Yeah, that's right. It's a really interesting time in education because a lot has been spurred by the pandemic. So, um, parents and and students began to make choices that are different than the choices that they might have been making before, whether it was related to health concerns or whether they didn't really like what was going on in their local school that they attend, whether that be, you know, school closures affecting uh, their learning and causing a lot of interruptions or the mental health uh, challenges for a lot of kids that come from having to wear a mask all day or distance or whatever it might be. We did see um, parents, and we don't have the, the the Stats Canada data on enrollment on this yet for um, to show the true two-year picture of exactly what those enrollment trends have been. But we do have a lot of anecdotal information from homeschool associations, um, the growth of a group called Learning Pods Canada, which largely exists in Ontario, um, and independent schools themselves and independent school associations saying that their interest level from parents um, and their enrollments have been a lot higher than they had been in years past. And uh, and some school districts as well, particularly in Ontario, released those numbers too. So we did see people choosing 
to to go away from the public school that they might have been attending and go toward mm -hmm. something that looks a lot more like a one room schoolhouse. The learning pods, as an example, um, so the, these are are essentially homeschool collectives, but they don't have to take place in your home. They can take place in a rented facility or something like that. And they don't all have to be the same age of children. Uh, mm -hmm. Children of all ages might be coming to learn together as kind of a collective. Um, and this is actually something that you, it's not that uncommon to see this in independent schools as well, even pre-COVID, um, where you have this mixed age learning um, of, of children of different ages learning together. And, and it's more focused on readiness level and an academic level um, and and really the, that mentorship that you get from combining ages is a real asset to that form of education and something that parents and educators actually look for. That's more similar to the one room schoolhouse where you did see, you know, a schoolhouse in a community that had a, a range of ages where the children took a lot more, especially the older children, ownership over mentoring and educating mm -hmm. their peers. Um, it's very different than the public school model that we have today and the model that we do see in a lot of independent schools and charter schools in Alberta, where you've got the kids together that are, you know, the same age, they're grouped by age more so than educational aptitude or readiness level. Um, they're, they're really all being taught the, the same uh, curriculum. And it's a bit more of an institutional approach that I do agree with you. A lot of Canadian parents are used to, but it certainly has not always been the case in education. And it is really fascinating that we're seeing a bit of this shift happening today. Talk to me a bit more about this learning pod regulatory structure is that just de developing organically or has it been enabled by government regulation is there is there a regulated size that you have to have on these learning pods or, or what is the typical size how are they structured so it's a really interesting question because it is a bit of a gray area so and it happened totally organically so what happened with the pandemic for the reasons that I cited, whether it's health, mental health, whatever it is, educational quality, parents decided they didn't want their kids uh, to be in the traditional public school system, or I say traditional public school system, but I mean, just the, the school system that most Canadians are using today. Um, and what they've done is, is sort of just formed these collectives. And it was a completely organic thing that started popping up, particularly in Ontario is actually where you saw um, a lot of this movement. And interestingly, Ontario, they closed, the government closed schools there for a longer period of time, uh, 20 weeks province-wide school closures in Ontario. That's longer than any other province in Canada. That is not accounting for individual school closures or regional school closures or just classes shutting down because of a uh, one kid who might have been exposed to COVID, for example. So there might be a policy connection there. Hmm. But you did see a lot of this, this organic uh, movement in Ontario, but I can tell you from, from researching this quite a bit that it does exist right across Canada. It's really parents getting together um, and forming their own pods of of kids to get together um, to to learn and whether that's taught by a parent or whether it's taught by a tutor or a teacher, um, whether that's in a rented space like a daycare facility or there were gyms that opened up for these learning pods or even a school room that wasn't being used or whether it's in someone's house or maybe it's a rotating house depending on the number of families. Um, it's it's It happened organically. The size, um, really the regulations that were restricting the growth of these learning pods in Ontario's case was that if you have more than five children learning together, you technically are supposed to register as a private school. Hmm. Now, that made it so that the you know people who wanted to be above board and operate these learning pods tended to keep it uh, five children or fewer. But it was a regulatory gray area, and there actually was a formal group called Learning Pods Canada that formed um, to help guide this, both to help connect parents and educators and parents with one another to form these pods in different regions, largely in Ontario, but right across the country, um, but also to help them navigate the, the legal uh, insurance and regulatory side of things. And I can tell you from speaking with this group that it is very much a gray area, but they're pretty much going by the private school regulations to try and stay under those number limits. 
It's so interesting that they would have such a limitation on it. I, have you followed the micro school movement in the U.S.? Because I thought that it's a little bit different, that instead of it being homeschool led or parent led, it sounds like it's teacher led, where a teacher who doesn't want to work under the confines of the existing school structure that we have right now essentially is able to go out and sounds like establish their own micro school. Do we do we have that kind of movement happening here? Do we have the regulatory environment that would allow it? Uh, it's really tough with the regulations, but I can tell you that uh, because I know it's, I mean, the Learning Pods Canada organization started out as a Facebook group. And even just from being in that Facebook group, I can tell you there's a lot of teachers who reach out wanting to form their own pods and attract parents. So it's not just parent led. Mm -hmm. So I would say that in that way, there is some overlap with the micro schools movement in the U.S., um, the U.S. would have different regulations from state to state, and I'm not as familiar with those. But I do think that there are there are, there are definitely some learning pods that are starting up in Canada that are led by teachers. The other thing is that there are very small private schools that exist um, in Canada, um, independent schools started by teachers, a, a lot of whom, you know, that I've spoken to might have taught in the public system or, or maybe at another larger independent school and wanting something different, uh, a small independent um, sort of uh, intimate type of, of environment, kind of like the one room schoolhouse approach. Um, there are some of these that are almost like forest schools with a, a very strong emphasis on nature and the kids having outdoor education. There's some that are a little bit more traditional, but just with much, much smaller groups. Um, and so I do think that you see elements of that within the Canadian system, but we certainly don't have the level of um, differentiation and of uh, innovation that you see in the States, maybe just by virtue of our population being smaller and more spread out. I want to jump to talking about independent schools in just a minute, but let me, so let's talk about the numbers of kids who are enrolled in homeschooling. It's quite striking that there is such a large number of homeschooled students in Alberta. Could be that we've been at it in Alberta a little bit longer, but you're still seeing growth in homeschooling across the entire country. And I, I suspect some of that has to do with the factors that you mentioned, school closures. And so just by necessity, parents making sure that their, their kids didn't have have a disruption in their education program. But but tell us some of the other factors that you're seeing about the, the growth in homeschooling. You know, it's funny, I think when I was back in, in school, it used to be considered truancy not to be in school. I don't know if they ever actually had a formal truant officer going door to door, but you'd never really have that concept now because it, it seems so well accepted that it's perfectly legitimate for kids to be at home learning with the direction of their parent virtually or with the guidance of a tutor. That seems to be quite a transformation in the last number of years. Yeah, absolutely. And especially during the pandemic, I mean, the pandemic has made it so that a lot more people have chosen homeschooling. And the reason I said I'm really interested to see the Statistics Canada data when it does come out for the two year trend, um, I, I'm interested how many people stuck with it because we saw a lot of people for pandemic related reasons choose to homeschool their kids or maybe join a learning pod or form a homeschool collective with their friends and neighbors, whatever it might be. But I am interested to see how many people have stuck with it because we do have data from the US showing that there has been quite a homeschool boom, um, where there have been a lot of parents who have decided to homeschool and at least for the time being, of course, we're not quite out of the pandemic, but in the US, they, they have a lot fewer restrictions and regulations related to COVID on children in schools in most states than we do here in Canada. Um, and so it's interesting that you've seen that here. I'm interested to see if the pattern uh, exists in Canada as well. But even before the pandemic, um, the number of homeschoolers, or the share of homeschoolers as the uh, of the total population of K to 12 kids uh, in Canada has increased from 2006-07. It was 0.3 percent of the population, so still a, of, of the population of K to 12. To K to 12 students. So still a small proportion. Um, it's risen to 0.7%, which is about the same as last year. But again, we only have the data that would show us what the enrollments were at the start of 2019-20, which is before the, the pandemic hit right in the spring of 2020. So we don't really exactly know. Um, but we did see that every province over this time period going from 06, 07 to 2019, 20 did experience an increase in homeschool enrollment, including in Alberta, where the numbers are slightly higher than the national average. Um, and and likewise, the, the share of students in independent schools um, increased as well. Um, and in public schools, I'm speaking nationally now, 
the the share actually went down. So the not all governments support homeschooling financially. I think there's at least the moral support of allowing it and having enabling re- regulations. But it seems to me, especially when you compare what governments are willing to spend on the traditional model of government run schools, the amount that that goes towards homeschooling is is pretty small. And so you have to be highly motivated to to do this as a, a parent or a family. Do you, have you explored why that is? Well, why isn't there more financial support to, for that type of schooling? Yeah, it's pretty rare uh, in Canada. I believe it's two provinces that do provide funding for uh, homeschooling families. And it's not the same level of funding that you'd see go to an independent school, as an example, in, in the provinces that do have that educational choice structure in place where you're, the parents, a portion of the parents' tax dollars follow them to the school of their choice. Um, it would still be a smaller level of support. Um, so, you know, I it's, it's a good question. And I think that the... I think that the homeschool community in many cases is also acutely aware of the fact that typically government funding comes with more government oversight and more government regulations. And there there is a connection between the provinces that do fund homeschooling and the level of of regulatory oversight that comes from the government. Um, And so in provinces like Ontario and Nova Scotia, where I live, the level of homeschool regulations uh, from the government and oversight it's very low. There's also no funding for those parents. So it's a, it's a tremendous sacrifice that parents would have to make. If you're not choosing to stay home with your child anyway, um, then, you know, one parent has to decide um, probably not to work or at least to work less than they would have otherwise. Um, so it is families that would be very dedicated to wanting to make this choice for their kids. Of course, it gives you the ultimate flexibility in that you can choose whatever curricula or blend of curricula you'd like for your child. You can go exactly at their pace. Um, And so a lot of homeschoolers that I have spoken to, and this is just purely anecdotal, but they don't really want the government, you know, Mm -hmm. um, dabbling in that. They want to be able to have that ultimate flexibility, that ultimate choice with little oversight from the government. So that might be why you don't see homeschool associations pushing for government funding. Um, But on the flip side of that, you know, those parents do pay taxes. They pay quite a bit of taxes that go towards educating children. Um, And we do, I think, have, you know, this miscommon or this misconception that comes from a lot of education stakeholders in Canada, that education tax dollars are supposed to be funding systems, they're supposed to be funding the public school system. And so they oppose educational choice policies that would see money going towards homeschooling families or would see money going towards independent schools. But shouldn't education tax dollars be funding students? I mean, that's really the question. Is is the money intended to be funding students in their education? Or is it to be funding systems in specific schools that certain stakeholders would like those Mm -hmm. children to attend? It's it's such a great question. So let's go through the other types of of schooling so that maybe we can circle back on that question to see if there is a rational funding model that would uh, that would make sense for the different the different types of options. So you, you mentioned that uh, the regulations for these learning pods that as soon as you get over five students, you have to register as an independent school. Uh, that language calling it an independent school, I think most people are accustomed to calling it a private school. Uh, But calling it that is a bit of a misnomer. And you go through some of the reasons for that. There's this notion that if you can send your child to private school, you must be an elite family paying an elite level of tuition that isn't accessible to everyone. But you've broken down the numbers and that isn't the typical independent school, is it? No, the majority of independent schools in Canada are not elite schools. Um, and the 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 level of um, family income as an as a for example, it's pretty similar um, in a lot of these independent schools. Um, for a public school family as it would be for an independent school family. Um, And that might be because a lot of families do, um, they they have to make tremendous sacrifices in order to send their children to a public school, but it is a choice that they want to make. Um, And so so you're right, I think it's, it's a misconception. And when you break down the data, it really does show that the assumption that all independent schools or private schools, whatever you'd like to call them, are elite in Canada is very far from the truth. So what is the advantage then of sending your child to an independent school? I think I think you said that you'd have to sacrifice a lot as a family in order to afford a tuition because most of them do have some type of tuition associated with it. But where does the independent school give an advantage? Mm-hmm. 
Uh, well, families, you know, I think that families choose independent schools for a lot of different reasons. It might be a cultural reason or a religious reason. Um, if you're, a, you know, a Sikh family, you might want to send your child to a Sikh school. That might be very important to you. Um, it could be that your child has an exceptional learning need, right? Um, you know, a, a I, I can't, I don't know the number offhand, but when I did do research into this in Alberta, I think about um, 10% or so of the schools uh, that are independent schools in the province are actually designated special education schools. Um, so, it, and I mean, in Nova Scotia here where I am, the, the government has um, a, a program called the tuition support program. It's the only level of financial educational choice that comes from the Nova Scotia government that funds independent schooling for uh, exceptional learning needs uh, and learning disabled children. So it might be that, you know, they're just not getting the support that they need to be able to really thrive in your local public school. And that's why you choose, um, that's why you choose an independent school. On the flip side, perhaps your child, or I mean, in some cases at the same time, perhaps your child is exceptionally academically gifted and you'd like them to be challenged because they're bored in public school. Mm -hmm. Um, that you might send your child uh, to a, a, an independent school that has a more rigorous academic curriculum. You might send your child to an independent school because it has a focus on sports and the sports program, uh, or perhaps the arts program, drama, theater, um, music is more comprehensive than what you'll find at the local public school. I think really when it comes down to it, it's all, it's, it's all different reasons. And that's really what makes you know, school diversity so special and so beautiful is that um, it's it's all up to these individual families to meet their child's individual learning needs. And if if it makes a difference in getting their child enthusiastic about getting up in the morning and going to school every day because their child has found the school that is the right fit for them, whether that's academics or extracurriculars or a cult cultural or religious focus um, or just something that meets their particular learning needs, um, then that, you know, all the better. That's really what education is supposed to be about, just getting the material across to the child in an engaging way that's going to support their success in the future. You explained that so well, which is why it's so surprising to me that more parents don't choose an independent school option. And it's got to, I would imagine, once again, come down to financial resources and financial support. So in Alberta, it's a bit confusing because they fund private uh, uh, independent schools at a rate that is a percentage of the operational student grants. So right. all of the different types of funding that goes to a, a, a school includes plant operations and maintenance, there's capital budgets. But if you just look at the at the operating student grant, then it, the private schools get, as I understand, 70% of that grant. But I think it's probably more generous here than it is anywhere else. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But is that a typical funding model for those independent schools? Is they don't get the full amount? That's typical. So of the provinces that do offer funding to independent schools, that's a typical model. It definitely varies. The amount varies. So the percentage varies. And even within Alberta, different schools get different levels of funding. Uh, there might be um, a different structure based on um, the type of school. Uh, there might be uh, and just, just different regulatory structures in each province. So different independent schools might get different levels of funding, but they can typically get up to a certain percentage. And that and that's what you're referring to. It's it's not the full amount um, that would um, be given to a public school to educate a, a child. Um, and it's certainly not, in most cases, the full amount to cover a child's tuition at an independent school. But as you say, it's it's based on a per student operational grant. And what is the like, what was the rationale behind that? I think it, it strikes me just where we began that there must be some misconception that only rich parents are sending their kids to school, therefore they don't need the support. But when you look at the numbers, if the average income is the same as those who are sending their kids to a traditional traditional school, it's almost like the policy hasn't really caught up with the reality. Is there, is there some argument that could be made for why that amount should be enhanced or equivalent? Well, there's certainly, yeah, I mean, there's arguments on both sides. I mean, there's, there's arguments that certainly come from, um, education stakeholders such as organized labor, the teachers unions that strongly push against funding for independent schools. Mm. Um, in some cases, they push against funding for charter schools in the case of Alberta, certainly. Um, and, and for homeschooling, for sure. Um, and, you know, those interests say that public tax dollars should be going to public schools. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer because public education really 
I mean, the public is everybody, right? So there's lots of people who are within the public um, that choose to send their children to edu uh, independent schools or might homeschool their children or, or whatever it might look like. Um, but yeah, I mean, then on, on the other side, the argument can be made that shouldn't equal stu students, shouldn't any student receive equal funding as another student? Mm -hmm. um, and shouldn't those tax dollars follow the the child to the school that that meets their educational needs the best? Is it about funding students? Or again, is it about funding systems? Hmm. Okay, so let's talk about another system that I, I get the sense that Alberta didn't implement this very well, which is their charter school model. Because if it had been implemented well, we'd have a lot more of them in Alberta, number one. But number two, I think you would have seen it take off in other jurisdictions since it's been in operation. I think you wrote for more than 20 years now. So there, so you'll have to explain, since it, it's probably not a very familiar term to most people, what is a charter school? What's the difference between a charter school and the independent schools we were just talking about? Mm -hmm. So a charter school um, is a school that is funded by the government um, in, in terms of operations. Parents do not pay tuition. They are public schools. They are public charter schools, but they are not part of the same government public school system that we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. um, they are nonprofit schools, um, but they are autonomous. So they function independently. Um, they, they do not function as part of the government in the same way that other public schools do. They are autonomous schools. They have a charter that um, it's basically a specific reason for having the school, a specific reason for existing. So whether it's an art school or a music school or a sports school, or perhaps it's an English second language school, um, there's an indigenous charter school. There's hmm. there's different types of charter schools that exist. Um, there's a rural education charter school for a focus on rural culture. It's a model that actually does offer a very unique educational approach um, in that they are funded and parents don't pay tuition at these schools um and but they do they do offer for a, uh, they do offer a lot of educational diversity relative to the public school system that most parents are used to and I think it's unfortunate uh, in a way that it hasn't expanded to to other provinces. As you said, it's been operating in, in Alberta for more than 20 years. They have very impressive results on on student tests, um, quite impressive relative to public schools and, and even relative to independent schools in the province um, on an overall basis. Um, when you look at the grade six and nine provincial achievement tests in Alberta, as I did a few years ago, um, charter schools in Alberta almost always outperform uh, mm -hmm. all other types of schools. So it's a really interesting model. I think that there is a lot of um, a lot of potential there. But as you said, there are these, it, it wasn't implemented perfectly. There was this cap put on the number of charter schools that could exist in the province. Um, and that made it very difficult to um, to operate a charter, to open a charter school in Alberta, really, that was the the barrier was to opening a new charter school. Um, and and that has since been lifted by the government in Alberta. So you may see the growth of charter schools expand. Of course, COVID has sort of a, put a, I'm guessing, put a roadblock in front of some of the development that might have been going on in the province. But we have heard about other ones. I know that there was a STEM charter school um, that was going to be started in Calgary. Um, I don't know if that one got off the ground yet. But um, there are other reforms that could make it easier to see more growth of charter schools in the province. Uh, but it's, it's certainly a, an interesting model that exists elsewhere in the world, in Europe, in the States, um, but nowhere else in Canada. That's remarkable. Yeah. And that's the STEM school. I have interviewed the, the, uh, the founder of that. And so they did manage to fast track it and get it through the process. And I'm hoping that that would be one that other school, other provinces would look at, because when you look at how fast technology is moving, so science, technology, engineering, math, to have the innovation that can come from having a, a, a school that's uh, more readily able to incorporate those new developments. I think that that is one of the, the principal advantages. And I, I would hope to see that it would go into other uh, into other jurisdictions. Okay, so we've talked about these different types of, of, of schooling systems that are available, but the vast, vast majority of parents put their kids into what we sh I think you've called government run schools, public schools. So, so tell us, um, tell us a, a little bit more about the structure because that isn't even uniform across the entire country either. 
Mm -hmm. so the structure of, of public schools, you mean? And yeah. yeah. So, so certain provinces have school boards. Uh, some provinces don't. Um, Nova Scotia, for example, eliminated school boards. Um, and these have sort of an oversight of, of public schools um, in the country. There's also a, a differentiation between provinces. Some provinces have both public schools and public Catholic schools. Um, Ontario, for example, where I grew up, you see both of those school systems. They're very similar. They're not, I think Catholic schools in Ontario are more similar to public schools in Ontario than Catholic school, than they are to say Catholic schools in British Columbia, where they are more cl closely tied um, to the Catholic church and Catholic teachings. Um, so you do have that and and there are some options that exist you know within public schools and they tend to differ um, from province to province but every province offers some level of french education within the public system so there's francophone schools um there's french immersion programs some schools offer uh, ib in high school which is sort of an international uh, program that um a little bit of an enriched ed academic program that kids can join um in public high schools in Canada and that exists to some extent across the country. Um, but by and large, public schools are attended by people, you know, within the local community. Um, as I mentioned earlier, many of them in Canada are bound by catchment areas, which means that kids have to attend their local public school. They really don't have much choice in the matter. Um, and if their parent wants to switch them schools, it's not an easy process. It depends on the enrollment in the school um, and it is made more challenging. Whereas some provinces like BC, for example, do not have catchment areas. You're not as restricted. You can choose any public school within limits um, that your child you know, would do better at. Um, but by and large, public schools look pretty much the same, at least within a province. You know, they're teaching the same curriculum. Um, there doesn't tend to be many um, programs within them that offer kind of different variety or choice to students. Um, it, it typically tends to be just about the same. It's, it's a bit of a one size fits all model. And it, it, you also see quite a bit of variation from one province to another about how many kids, uh, although it's the majority of kids enrolled in that style of school, it's uh, the highest enrollment, I believe, is in one of the Atlantic provinces, over 98%. You'll have to remind me in New Brunswick, is it? And in Labrador, I believe. And so that's probably an indication that they don't have a very robust development of homeschooling or independent schooling or any any financial support for that. That would be my yes. my assumption of seeing yes. such a high level of enrollment in a government funded school. And then British Columbia is another strange example because I think they also had used to have Catholic schools. But then they did they end that Catholic school system? And that's why they have so many people who are still enrolled in those type of programs, but they now officially call them independent schools. Is that the weird nuance in British Columbia? You know, I'm not, I don't know offhand, actually, the history of that. But in the independent schools or Catholic schools in British Columbia today are public or are rather are independent schools and they are operated, as I said, more closely um, with the Catholic Church. They might be associated with, you know, an association within that community, um, but but not in the same way that they are operated in provinces that have a system of public Catholic schools like we see in Ontario. But you're absolutely right when you make the point about Newfoundland and Labrador, for example, you know, you have such a high level of enrollment in public schools um, because there's just really not the independent school option mm -hmm. uh, in most cases, but also it could be tied to the, the policy, the fact that, you know, there is no support for educational choice in that way. Um, parents tax dollars do not follow their child to an independent school if they choose to go there or to homeschooling they will only go to the public school which essentially means that parents who want to choose an independent school for their child are paying twice right mm -hmm. you're paying tuition at the, the independent school but you're also paying quite a lot of education tax dollars to support the public education system you'll have to explain I'm, I, I i had it sticking in my mind when you said it that in nova scotia they have no school boards. I'm trying to imagine what that might look like because Nova Scotia, I mean, it's a, a, a large jurisdiction. So you would, I don't, I'm trying to think offhand of, tell us how many kids would be in your school system because, or in the overall 
enroll, I can't even call it a school system. I don't even know how to talk about a jurisdiction <laughs> that doesn't have school boards. So how many kids are there in Nova Scotia? And then tell us how those schools operate if they don't operate under the umbrella of a school district. So I don't know the total enrollment number offhand in Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia is a province of close to a million people. Uh, it's a province with a heavily aging population. Um, I would have to, to look up what the total enrollment is. But so basically what happened was they eliminated elected school boards in Nova Scotia and they amalgamated it into it's almost one government committee mm -hmm. um, and uh, with appointees. So that's that's how the decisions uh, are made, just made by this this government committee, and so it's basically closely tied with the provincial government. Has that been successful, or do you, have you heard any concerns about that? It sounds like we did something similar in healthcare, and it hasn't right. been an entirely smooth path. So I don't know that I've heard any controversies one way or the other. So do you know if it's working well? Yeah, so it's sort of it's an interesting uh, comparison with the um, amalgamation of of health. Um, in uh, in Alberta of the health authority um, and and you know that's another thing that looks different from province to province there was a lot of um, pushback when it happens certainly mm -hmm. from a lot of education stakeholders in the province from a sort of democracy perspective um, others thought well we're a relatively small province with a relatively small enrollment and uh, and these decisions can be overseen by by one, uh, committee or board oversight committee uh, doesn't need to have we don't need to have elected school boards um, so I would say the reaction was mixed um, and there hasn't been a lot of upset really since the change was made but I mean the pandemic I think has has complicated things because it is a relatively recent change that was made not too long before COVID struck. Okay, well, I'll, I'll continue to follow that knowing yeah. that, that they've done it because sometimes you end up with decisions being made in one province that then have a way of, of migrating to a, another province. So yeah. when we're when we're looking overall at the at the way that education is structured, do, do you feel like there is and sometimes you see this that uh, in other jurisdictions, there's a lot more of a federal role in in uh, in delivery of of uh, of education. Certainly in America, you often hear their president talking about no child left behind. Um, and so to have this uh, the, such differentiation between provinces, is that is that healthy? Is that uh, a, the best way to structure it? Why is it that we're so different? I think it's healthy. Um, I think Canada is a very large and very, um, very, uh, a big, very big country, both land wise, but also I think that the regions are very different from one another. Um, and and decisions are, are, are best made locally. Um, when it comes to, in my view, healthcare and education being provincial jurisdictions, I do think makes sense. Um, but they're also, I think, important in that discussion is standards, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, sure, absolutely, like, let's allow, I mean, I'm a big believer in diversity in the education system in general. General, whether you're talking about local schools and all different types of independent schools and learning pods and collectives and homeschooling, I love to see all of that and, and choice within our public school systems as well to the extent that that can exist. Um, and so I do think that having the provinces control education is a, is a um, that's a part of that, right? As opposed to having one federal um, committee, I can see, you know, in your province, probably maybe not wanting decisions made for children um, in Ottawa, you know, people in Alberta might not be too keen on that and people in BC as well and people in Quebec, whatever it might be, you know, the, the education policies do look pretty different from province to province, depending on what you're talking about. Um, and so I do think that that is a good thing, but there do, there do need to be standards. So in that, I do think it's very important that all provinces have a level of standardized testing for students to ensure that they're keeping up with their provincial colleagues and also that they're keeping up with international um, peers, right? So there are international tests like the PISA standardized tests that do test children in Canada, um, but we could have more comprehensive provincial standardized testing regimes that really don't even really exist um, to the extent that they should in many provinces to ensure that kids are keeping pace with one another, mm -hmm. that schools are keeping pace with one another. And this is, I think, particularly important if you're going to have educational choice policies. Um, 
trying different things, right? Innovation within the system, that's all good, but we need to make sure that the students are all performing well um, in our public schools and in our independent schools. Um, and, and then just making sure that the provinces are, are keeping pace with one another, I think is just very important. Um, so having that decentralization, I, I do believe is good as long as we can ensure that no kids are falling through the cracks. Talk to me a little bit about standardized tests because I, I think I've, I've never really fully understood the pushback that that the uh, the teachers unions have on that. I guess I, I, I have always felt, because I was uh, on the school board in Alberta in the 90s and then on a private school board as well. So I followed education for some time. I've always felt like we should be doing the Canada basic skills testing? Uh, can you read at grade level? Can you write and comprehend at grade level? Can you do the math at grade level? If you, if you do that test at the beginning of the year to see what your starting point is, and then at the end of the year to see how much you learned and then do that every year, you'd have a really good record of how each student was pro progressing on an individual basis. And I, I don't know if the achievement tests that each province offers it seems to me like the constant argument that you hear from teachers is you're teaching to the test. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure I understand what the difference is between the two. And isn't there some common ground that can be that can be held there? Because teachers surely want to know that their kids are, are, are progressing from one grade to the next, just as much as parents do, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, standard. So, so at the Fraser Institute, we put together report cards um, in the provinces that offer comprehensive standardized testing where we can rank schools based on the standardized test scores at those schools. Um, there is pushback from organized labor and teachers unions often to those uh, report cards that we publish and to standardized testing, as you said, in general. Um, and you know, it, it does standardized testing does allow for those type of rankings. It does allow to show which schools are struggling and, and need to learn from the best practices that other schools are exhibiting. Um, and some people don't like that. I think that, you know, striving for improvement and believing that improvement is possible for individual students, for classes, for teachers, for schools is so important in our progress in the education, in the education system, but also just in the education of our children in general. So important to believe that improvement is possible. Um, and you need to have a fair, objective measure that all students um, in a province are, are tested with to be able to have that launch point to see, okay, how can we improve? How are our students doing? Um, and, and in what areas can they improve, whether it's in math or English or numeracy, literacy, whatever the test um, is measuring. And sadly, we've moved away from that. Um, in So for example, in, in British Columbia, where we do have one of our, um, well, two of our report cards, we do the elementary school report card, we do the el el elementary and the secondary school report card. Um, and at the secondary school level, we've moved away in British Columbia from uh, exam type of tests, where a percentage of their exam mark um, on that standardized exam goes towards the student's final grade in that course. And we've moved towards broader, kind of vaguer student assessments. Now students mm -hmm. need to complete these assessments in order to graduate, although the participation rates are actually quite low um, and, and really do need to be improved, um, both pre-COVID and during the pandemic. Um, but they get sort of a, a comment based mark, uh, sort of an exceeding expectations or performing to, mm -hmm. to, to standard, whatever that, that comment might be. It's not a percentage grade. It's also, a, we've switched from it being that higher stakes test that I described where, you know, a portion of your mark um, for that final grade in that course is the mark that you get on the exam to, um, they're really not being a percentage grade and it not affecting your final mark at all. So it's a very low stakes test for, to, for students to take. So students and teachers are not motivated to the same degree to actually perform as best they can on those tests or assessments as they're now called in this example. Mm -hmm. And that makes it harder for us to really know how students are doing. It's not that fair 
objective measure by which all students um, are tested uh, to really give us that baseline of understanding to know how students are doing. Because if the stakes are really low and they, they just need to complete the test, they can just scribble whatever they want on the page, hand it in, and, and there you go, the test or the assessment is completed. Um, so we are seeing this shift in Canada away from standardized tests that are just so important to know how students are doing. I would say particularly so in the era of COVID where there has been so many learning interruptions, so much interruption to classroom learning, so much learning loss that parents are saying has, has occurred in their children um, and experts are saying as well. We need to know how students are doing and, and in what areas they're struggling or in what areas they're exceeding expectations so that we can know how to improve. Well, and truly, I mean, I think the real problem that we have, especially in Alberta, which I've never understood, is that we didn't test every year. We had standard tests in grade three and grade six and grade nine and then grade 12. And it's a bit of a mystery to me about why you would want to have a three year gap before you do that kind of check in on a child, because this is one of the things that teachers would argue is that I, I in particular, I remember talking to teachers who were at one of the, the schools that dealt with kids who were really struggling by the time they got to, uh, to high school. They said, it's not really fair for us to be judged based on the grade 12 test because a lot of our kids show up here with a grade one reading level. And we feel like we're doing a pretty darn good job if we can bring them up to a grade nine or grade 10 reading level by the time they graduate. But the standardized test doesn't capture that level of improvement. And, and so I think that's one of the big problems is that by not testing more frequently every year, you don't know whether a kid ran into trouble in the grade one and grade two, and then they managed to get caught up in grade three. And I, I don't understand why there would be a reluctance to do more testing. It, it seems like I know that you're sort of stuck with having to analyze the data that you're getting. It's always been a head scratcher for me about why, why we wouldn't want to have standardized tests every year. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it also would facilitate more adaptive learning, you know, to allow teachers, as you say, to to see how students are performing, be able to adapt um, and, and in their education for those kids um, and really tailor it more so. Um, I think just, you know, assessment and testing from a fair objective measure, especially if you're going to use terms like, okay, they're at grade nine level or whatever it might be needs to be fair, it needs to be even across the board for different students. Of course, this is only one of many important measures, whether it's in how your child is doing in the classroom, or whether it's in what school you want to choose for your child, right? So if you're in British Columbia and you're using the Fraser Institute report card, for example, to help make your decision about which school to choose for your child, um, because academic performance is really important to you, important to your child, um, well, of course, you're, you might look into the report card, and that's a really valuable, empowering tool for parents, but it's only one of many. Uh, you might talk to other parents in the community. You might talk to the school administrators at that school or talk to somebody in the Ministry of Education. Um, you, there's so many different um, measures that parents can use and, and education stakeholders can use to see how schools are doing, to see how students are doing. And obviously teachers are, are going to do their own other types of assessments of children throughout the year. Um, but standardized tests are really the only fair objective measure that we have to track student performance and make sure that they are up to standard, really, so that they're not falling through the cracks. Because if they're not, um, if they're not meeting those expectations, it's going to be, you know, so much harder for them the next year without having those foundation stones laid in place. Um, and of course, if you're in a province that, you know, your schools are really struggling compared to another province. If you're an education policymaker in that province, you're going to want to look to the province that has the best performing schools and say, okay, what are the best practices that they are employing that we can learn from them, talk to them, try to emulate some of what they're doing and, and do it in our own province to improve. There are just so many uh, important things that can come from having that fair objective measure that it is it is disappointing to see the the level of pushback um, that they're getting, but that's the reality. I mean, there is an organized push going on right now in British Columbia from the teachers union and other uh, some other education stakeholders to eliminate 
standardized testing for students in the province, saying that, you know, we've had gaps in this testing during COVID. There has been gaps in BC. There's been gaps in other provinces as well where these tests just haven't taken place. Of course, the learning interruptions that happened during COVID have impacted how students are doing. I would argue that's why we need testing to measure where students are at so we can improve upon it for every child. Um, but some argue that, well, that just means we should, you know, throw the tests out the window. Um, they're completely pointless now. And uh, and I think it's really unfortunate that we're seeing that, but it is quite an organized push that's happening in Canada right now against standardized testing. Well, you're very right because you've done a, a Leger poll or there was a recent Leger poll. You'll have to tell me if you commissioned it or if you were just uh, writing on it that, sh that shows the parents have a level of concern that their kids have fallen behind during COVID and they should have something more than just a gut feeling that things are not going well. That's part of what testing does. If you can do the test, find out that they are behind, then it allows you to do remedial work or hire a tutor. Um, and I, it, but it does seem like public opinion polling on that is, is not the most accurate way of testing. I, I would rather see a standardized test so that you can be certain that kids are either falling behind or at grade level. So get, tell us a little bit about that, about that, that poll so you can, we can get a little, a sense of how anxious parents are. Yeah, so we commissioned a poll with Leger um, that did interview a thousand parents uh, of kids in K to 12 education right across the country um, to give a representative sample from each province. And um, what we found was quite a high level of concern amongst parents in the learning loss that occurred as a result of not just COVID, but the government's response to COVID. Because I do think it's easy to kind of say, oh, well, this is all spurred by the pandemic. But, and of course, this is an unprecedented situation, but government policy responses from province to province differed. You know, we talked earlier about how Ontario did close uh, schools, public schools, for longer than any other province did. So the policy response is really important here too. Um, what we found is that nearly 70% of parents nationally feel that their child has fallen behind to some extent as a result of the pandemic and the government's response to it. And that 17% of parents nationally actually believe that their child has fallen behind and they're they're not confident that the school has a plan to catch them up. So that's about one in five parents of, of kids in K-12 education in Canada um, or close to it that believe that their child has fallen behind and their child's mm -hmm. school has no plan to catch them up. Um, and as I said, close to 70% of parents overall that say that to some extent their child has fallen behind. Well, it'd be interesting to cross-reference those with actual data to see whether or not they're accurate. And I, I've heard from some testing that's being done that there is an indication that especially in those younger grades, kindergarten to grade three, when you're just learning how to read, those are areas where we have seen kids already measurably falling behind. Those who have some level of reading ability, maybe it's because they're able to learn more independently in, um, in, a, in a home environment. But it does seem to me that teachers would want to get this data because it would demonstrate how vitally important a classroom education is. You would think that that would allow them to make the case about the continuity of education for students and that virtual is not going to be the replacement for all students and that the professionalization of teaching has been a really important trend. And so it's it's odd that you would think that this would be an opportunity for them to demonstrate that disruption has caused problems that would that would really in my opinion, really reassert their role as, as educational professionals. What am I missing? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, it does show how important for children who are in school, um, how important classroom learning is. And I, I think you're absolutely right. At the younger grades, it just, you know, I have a young son who's in school. It makes intuitive sense. If you were to stick him in front of a screen all day, he's not going to learn. It's just That's not conducive to how little kids learn. Um, he can't read what's on the screen. It's not going to happen. Whereas if you're in high school and, and you can have your classes virtually, okay, there might not be as much learning loss. But I do think... You know, it probably was different uh, in the case of every child. Some parents who are home with their kids were not working and they could maybe assist their child more. Some parents were working. It was a really stressful time for them, could mm -hmm. not assist their children very well, or maybe just are not naturally great teachers, um, you know, in the same 
to the same quality that they would get in a classroom. Um, so it probably differed from child to child, but I think the numbers that you're seeing are, are quite striking. They were particularly high in Ontario and in the prairies um, in terms of that very concerned portion of parents. Mm -hmm. um, 20% in Ontario felt that their child had, was, had fallen behind and are not confident that the school had a plan to catch them up. 21% um, in the prairies um, of parents felt that way. So there are particular pockets in the country where you did see um, that there, there and, and as I mentioned, maybe it's the connection to the policy in Ontario, you know, the schools were closed for longer than anywhere else. Um, you did see quite a, um, a strong reaction from the government when it came to um, to shutting down classroom learning in that province and, and perhaps parents are responding to that. One other interesting thing that we found in the poll um, because we were talking about independent schools is that parents of children in independent school were more likely to say that their education, their child's education was either minimally impacted mm -hmm. or a little bit impacted. So 82% of parents with kids in independent schools fell into that category mm -hmm. um, versus 64% in public schools. So basically in children um, or parents of children in independent schools were a lot more likely to say that there wasn't as great of an impact um, mm -hmm. and less likely to say that their child school does not have a plan to catch them up or they're not confident that their child school has a plan to catch them up. So quite a divide there, almost 20%. Yeah. And I, I said, I don't imagine you split out um, homeschooling because that's such a small number anyway, but I, I guess it's reasonable to presume that there would have been virtually no disruption in, well, in yeah, homeschooling. Exactly yeah. They yeah. just weren't, I don't think as impacted. Right. So, I mean, just anecdotally, the only friends of mine whose kids didn't seem very affected by COVID mm -hmm. school policies and COVID in general were the homeschooling friends because um, because pretty much went on business as usual. Um, but in independent schools and, uh, and in public schools where you did see this shift from classroom learning to having to shift at home, you know, there were differences in which schools transitioned quick enough to virtual learning, um, which schools were set up fast enough and which students were kind of just left in the lurch um, for longer periods of time without really any learning happening at all. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was really kids who were who began in classroom learning. So tell me where you think education is going, because one of the big trends that I noticed from when I was in school versus where we're at today is that the class sizes are the same, in some cases larger, but the complexity of the kids in the classroom is so different. We used to have um, smaller classes for what at the time was for students with special learning needs, but there has been a real move towards integrated classrooms. And so you do have English um, as a second language uh, learners. You've got a number of different um, behavioral uh, disorders that are manifesting in the classroom. You've got uh, people with mild and moderate uh, disabilities, students there, and you've got all of this additional pressure to have individualized learning for teachers to put these programs together at a time when their class sizes are pretty large. And so it strikes me that this move towards wanting to have independent or individualized learning, that's not going to end. That's going more and more, especially as we go on and we can see that we can develop our own apps and we can get the information that we want when we need it online. It seems to me that that is a trend that's going to continue, but is the system able to accommodate that? And if not, what does that mean about how we how we meet the needs of future learners? What, what sort of emerging trends are you seeing? If you were to look out 10 or 20 years, what, what do you think will change? Well, I do think that, you know, we've seen um, pre-COVID a move towards more people attending, uh, more children attending independent schools and homeschooling and fewer children attending um, public schools in, in almost every province. So in Alberta and, uh, and, and there was, so it was eight out of 10 provinces, Alberta being one of them were actually the, the public school enrollment um, actually uh, increased um, and independent school enrollment actually uh, marginally decreased mm -hmm. over this period. But in general, so just to give 
give a picture of uh, independent school enrollment, nationally speaking, from 2006 to 2007, 6.7% nationally of students were enrolled in independent schools to 2019-20, 7.6%. Um, so it was a marginal increase, but I mean, you're talking about a small portion of the overall K-12 student population as it is. Um, so, and we did actually see a slight increase um, from last year in terms of the proportion of students of the overall student population that are being educated in independent schools. Uh, so I, I think that you'll probably, you know, if I had to, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think it's reasonable to assume that given the we have you know several years here now that we can look at it both in homeschooling and independent schooling that we are continuing to see growth in these sectors and you know as i mentioned i'm, I'm interested to see um, the impact that the pandemic will have and how many people actually stick with that learning pods brand new trend in canada there's always been homeschooling collectives but learning pods certainly have um seen you know um some growth in ontario i mean anecdotally speaking it's Certainly, these uh, associations have increased in terms of um, their their interest, and parents are actually doing this. So it'll be interesting to see how many uh, children do shift to that. But I think that you're right in that the the needs of the classroom are more complex uh, than they once were because of inclusive education policies to have every child in the same classroom, um, and we just don't see a lot of diversity and choice within public school systems and public schools themselves. Um, and, and so it is this one size fits all model. And that's a challenge, you know, that's, that's a challenge for the teacher at the, the front of that classroom to reach every child and teach the material in a way that is accessible mm -hmm. and engaging for every child when every child is so different, right? Kids are not one size fits all. So schools being one size fits all, it presents a challenge. Um, and so, you know, without having a crystal ball, I guess it's just up to, to families, it's up to parents to, to see, um, are they going to make these these choices for their kids, which often do involve financial sacrifice? Um, and, uh, and, and are they going to, to make those decisions? But of course, the role of government, you know, in this is, is a critical one as well. Our government's going to move towards supporting parents who want to make those choices for their children. Um, as five out of 10 provinces have done, they do have some level of educational choice from a financial policy perspective where parents' tax dollars follow kids to the school of their choice to a certain extent. You know, will the Atlantic provinces in Ontario, which actually does have a, a good amount of kids that actually do attend independent schools in Ontario, will that province support those kids um, by, by having those, those empowering policies in place? It's a bit of a political hot potato, but particularly in Ontario, but it would be, I think, a positive thing to see governments embrace that diversity and fund students and not just the public school system. Totally true. But from what I could see of your numbers is that uh, there's the parents really are very sensitive to how much money they have to pay out of pocket. And if you make it easier for them to pursue other choices, you're going to see a growth in those choices. Now, is it possible to move to a model or have you seen this anywhere in the world where you do have full funding of the, of the student following that student to the school of parental choice? So in the case of Alberta, I think that the calculation they've done now, if you do an all in cost about how much it costs to educate a student in K to 12 on average in a public school, it's about $13,000. So that's, let me just throw that number out there. Is there anywhere in the world where it would be there's thirteen thousand dollars attached to your um, your student, your child, and whether they go to an independent school or a charter school or a public school or a francophone school or a Catholic school, they're going to get the same amount of money. Do you, do you see anything like that when you look around the world? In um, the countries in Europe, there there are policies that more closely mirror that, mm -hmm. um, where you might have. Um, policy or schools that almost look more like charter schools in Alberta, which are, uh, there's no tuition for parents, fully funded by the government, um, and in some cases don't have to be nonprofit like Alberta charter schools do. They could be for-profit schools, um, but you do have this tuition-free model for parents. Um, having that level of educational choice, um, those money follows the student type of policies is more common um, in Europe than you'd see 
in Canada where it's about, you know, 50% of the provinces offer that. Um, so there are certainly, there's a lot of different models, you know, in Canada, we tend to look at, I mean, particularly in healthcare, we tend to look at the US and think, okay, that's the only other alternative. Um, and there are different, uh, different types of educational policies that exist um, within the United States, certainly that could be good models for Canada, whether that's education savings accounts, where every parent gets, you know, amount of money, they can put it towards whatever type of education they want. But they do have um, more of those type of voucher systems that you're referring to um, in, in different countries in Europe and the Scandinavian countries um, that Canada, I think a lot of Canadians like to look to for policy um, that does exist there. Um, and and you, you do see as a result, higher proportions of students attending uh, independent schools or schools that look more like charter schools. Any other innovative policy ideas that could help defray the cost for parents that you've seen anywhere else? The one that you're right, the one that I think most uh, people who want some school choice and reform or default to is, is the voucher style system that we were just talking about. But is there anything else that, that uh, policymakers should consider? Well, I think that you can you can fund it in a in a variety of different ways. Um, you can fund you can put the funding directly in parents' hands via a voucher or via an education savings account, where you're not just giving cash to parents. That it has to be spent on education. Um, that is something that you know you do see in a few different U.S. states, um, and mm -hmm. there there is some precedence there that we can look at. Um, and then there is you know the model that we have in Canada, where you might you could just increase that level of funding where the the money goes to the school school on a per student operational basis. Um, and the schools can then in turn lower their tuition costs as a result. Um, so there's there's different models in place for sure. Um, then there's the charter school model, which allows for more autonomous public schools that are tuition free for parents. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, from the US to Alberta, in Europe, there's there's differentiation even within that model that you can look at, um, allowing those schools to be for profit versus nonprofit. There's a lot of diversity in how education systems can be funded. Certainly the one size fits all local public school model that so many Canadian kids um, are part of is not at all the only model of education that's out there. Um, there are certainly models that support a great deal more diversity within the education systems and in, within the education of students in general. Um, and, and I think that, you know, if governments are open to this approach, learning pods, mini schools, these can all be funded um, to some extent as well, if governments wish to go in that direction. But governments need to be open minded It needs to come from a place of, of wanting to support students, recognizing that there are challenges, recognizing that we're not coming from a one size fits all place when it comes to children. Children are all different. They all have different learning needs and interests and different things that are going to engage them in classroom learning. And and I think that, you know, governments just tuning out the very loud stakeholders in education that push for the one size fits all model to be the only model that gets more and more funding every year without having to make very many changes um, and, uh, and, and opposing funding for all other models. Governments, I think, need to just refocus and think more closely about individual students and their individual needs. And then maybe they'd be open to more innovation and more diversity. That is such a great note to end on. You've given us so much to think about. Thank you so much for your analysis and for your time today. Thank you so much. That was Paige McPherson. She, of course, is the Associate Director of Education Policy at the Fraser Institute. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe on YouTube and wherever you stream your podcasts. And to stream old episodes, learn more about the show, and where to subscribe and submit your questions for future guests, visit fraserforum.org.